Amen. Praise God. Hasn't it been a great service this morning? Amen. I'm excited to minister today. And if you have your Bibles, uh, just stand with me as we get ready to read the word. And uh, I'm excited. This, this week has been a, a, a very powerful week for me. Not only the events of yesterday. How many, how many were excited? Wasn't that great? And uh, it's exciting to see what's happening, not only here in our church, but also the new things that are happening there in Chula Vista. I'm believing for some great things in Chula Vista. We have a wonderful young team that is learning about ministry. They're dedicated, hardworking, and God is using that team to break open Chula Vista. And how many think we're going to do powerful things for God in Chula Vista? Oh, man. And if you live in Chula Vista, I encourage you to be a part of what's happening there. So that was exciting. Also, yesterday, I played in a celebrity softball game. And that was pretty funny. You know, celebrities. Pastor, what are you doing hanging out with celebrities, you know? I, I don't know. I have no idea, you know? But I was there with a purpose, and it wasn't to be with celebrities. But I was asked by the San Diego Police Department. How many know we're developing a stronger relationship with them? And they said, we need someone to represent us uh, in that community because, you know, we're not the most favorite people. <laughs> and we need someone who could represent San Diego PD in that game. And they said, what about Pastor Al? Can you go? And I said, sure, anything for, anything for San Diego PD. So I was there playing in the game and representing San Diego PD and also representing Victory Outreach. Aww. Victory Outreach. And they all knew us. They all knew us. They go, oh, yeah, we know you. We know you. Even some of the people there say, I used to minister in the church years ago and different people. And I want to let you know that I did well. <laughs> I hit a double and I scored. And I, I started a seven-run rally with two outs. So some of you baseball people say, that's pretty good. Pastor knows what's up. Amen. And that was great. And then also this week, it was exciting to be able to go to Lake Arrowhead. I was there on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday with our founders and our elders. And we gathered together there in Lake Arrowhead for a time of prayer. And how many are grateful for a ministry that believes in prayer? Believes in prayer. And we really got together and we stood there at Lake Arrowhead and we really began to pray. And we began to pray for the people of Victory Outreach. We begin to really pray, not only for the people, but also pray for the ministry and to believe God for what he wants to do through this ministry in the future. And how many know we got a third wave coming up? Third wave coming up in the ministry. And we, we're believing that God is gonna use that generation in a mighty way, but how many know God's not done with us either? And I want you to know we're all part of that third wave. Tell your neighbor, you're part of the third wave. And we're strategizing through prayer as elders on how we're going to advance this ministry uh, and continue to see these promises come to pass of enlarging and taking the cities all over the world. And I'm excited that tomorrow, uh, Georgina and I, uh, we're going to be going to Ohio again tomorrow. We're going tomorrow. And, uh, but this time, we're taking mom and dad with us, Pastor Sonny and Julie. We're also taking Pastor Rick. We're also taking Pastor Joe. We're also taking Barry and, and a few others. Debbie, Debbie. So we're going with the big guns. But how many think we can take the East Coast for Jesus? Amen. Will you pray for us? Will you pray against any opposition that the enemy tries to bring against us? And, and, and last night I was up. I was up. I went to sleep like at nine because I was so tired. I was sunburned. My legs hurt. And then I woke up around 10 and I couldn't sleep. And, and I felt the enemy trying to lie to me. And how I many when the enemy lies, you got to rebuke that enemy. I mean, you got to rebuke that enemy. You got to cast down those thoughts and imaginations. And I said, fear you will not have me. Amen. And I think that's why God gave me this scripture. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to open up to the book of Zechariah chapter 4. And when I was in Lake Arrowhead, I felt the Lord give me this scripture. And uh, as soon as I began to study it, God started speaking to me. Zechariah chapter 4. Go to the book of Haggai and make a right. And it's like, where is it? 
It's one of those books you don't read that often because it sticks to the pages when you're turning there. Some of you are not even attempting to look for it. You're just like, just read it. I don't know where it is. <laughs> Zechariah chapter 4. And we're going to read one scripture here found in verse 6. When you have it, say amen. You know it well. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but, my, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Say it real strong. Say, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Look at your neighbor and tell him, God's going to speak to you this morning. And you go ahead and have your seat today. Sometimes God will give you a scripture, won't he? And he'll point you in the word, especially when you're praying. And I heard the voice of God just whisper to me, not by my, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. This morning, I want to speak to you a message entitled, The Vision of the Four Horns. The vision of the four horns. And we look at the book of Zechariah. This is a very powerful book. If you've ever read this book, it's a prophetic book. Zechariah was a minor prophet. And it's a powerful book of visions and dreams. And the importance of these visions and dreams is that it's the timing. Someone say the timing. It's the timing of the vision, the timing of the dreams in which God used Zechariah. What we find is that the time was when the people of Judah were involved in the rebuilding of the temple. And one of Zechariah's contemporary prophets, one of his contemporaries was a prophet that you all know by the name of Haggai. How many remember Haggai? And many of you remember that Haggai was sent by God to speak to the people about the rebuilding of the project of the temple. They had come out of captivity and a portion of them from Judah were released back home and they began to get to work on the temple, on the house of God. And that was their mission. But how many know that when the prophet Haggai had come, he he told them, you've got to begin to work again on the project, work again on the building. Now, to give you just a tiny little bit of background, what it, what it was actually happening was that some of the older believers, some of the older saints, had become critical and discouraged because they felt that the project was too small. In comparison to the glory of Solomon's temple, how many remember Solomon's temple? The one that David stored up for. Well, in comparison to that temple, they had become a little critical, a little discouraged because they felt that the project was too small. And because they felt that way, they had allowed other things to come and divert them from the project. So what happened was they had started the project, but they didn't finish the project, even though they had the ability. How many know we have the ability? God has given us the ability to do great things. So what the Bible tells us is that the Lord sent the prophet Haggai to come in and to stir them up again, to stir them up again. Now, how many know that sometimes we, we do get discouraged and sometimes we, we need to be stirred up about things in our life? I think that's what makes church great. I think that's why many of us come on a Sunday morning, because sometimes we we do get discouraged about some things. And sometimes God, God needs to put us under the hearing of that word. And he uses that word to stir us up. How many have ever felt stirred up in the house of God? And we sometimes we, we need God to stir us up. You know, I thank God that God will stir you up. I, I thank God that God will never leave you discouraged. He'll never leave you defeated. He'll never he'll never leave you distracted. How many know God will always send you a messenger? Come on, somebody. How many are grateful for those messengers in your life? And he'll never let you stay down for too long. Tell neighbor, don't stay down too long. No, but God will, will send the messenger, and God never allows his people to remain down, discouraged, defeated. And through the prophet Haggai, what happened was the people started to work again. So what we find here now is that God sends a, a second messenger, because how many know God's a thorough God? 
How many know he's a finishing God? And he sends a second messenger by the name of Zechariah. Now, Zechariah, he begins to give him a series of dreams and visions. If you read the book, it's a book of dreams and visions. And he gives him these dreams and visions to communicate to him and to the people of Israel one clear message. What was that message? The message is this. Don't lose heart. Haggai came to stir him up. Zechariah came to tell him, don't quit. Man, I, I like that. I like that. He came to tell him, don't lose heart when... And he tells him this, don't lose heart when the horns begin to blow. Don't lose heart when the horns begin to blow. Go with me to Zechariah chapter 1, and I want to talk to you about the vision of the four horns. Are you with me so far? In verse 18, this is the vision that Zechariah had. It says, when I raised my eyes and looked, and there were, there were four horns, and I said to the angel who talked with me, what are these? So he answered me, these are the horns that have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. These are the horns that have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. And then the Lord showed me four craftsmen. And I said to them, or in some versions it says four carpenters. And I said, what are these coming to do? And he said, these are the horns that scattered Judah so that no one could lift up his head but the carpenters are coming to terrify them, to cast out the horns of the nations that lifted up their horn against the land of Judah to scatter it. And what we find in this scripture is in a vision, Jeremiah sees four horns. And through this God-given vision, he's showing the prophet of God the strategy that the enemy has used to defeat Israel. Last night I was up. I couldn't sleep because there was a horn blowing. And some of you know what it is to go through this life and hear certain horns. And the, and the prophet is seeing this vision because God is showing him these horns that blow to scatter and defeat the people of God. Now, when you read about horns in the Bible, I want you to know that horns always represent power. Whenever you read about a horn, it's not a, a trumpet. A trumpet is different than a horn. A horn is actually a ram's horn. And whenever you read about horns in the Bible, it represents power. Someone say power. power. It's power for good or power for evil. When David was anointed king over Israel, the prophet Samuel took the horn of a ram, filled it with oil, and he poured it over David's head, representing the power of God and the anointing of God. But these horns that were blowing were horns to scatter, horns to defeat, horns to destroy. The horns represented power. And these were the horns that caused the people of God to scatter. They represent the principalities and the powers. They represent the power of the enemy that he sends to stop the projects of God. And he sends to stop the people of God from reaching their full potential and advancing the kingdom of God. And if the truth be told, many of you know right now somebody quite possibly who has stopped moving forward, stopped advancing the kingdom of God because the horns have been blowing in their life. Am I preaching all right this morning? I want to talk to you about these four horns, there are, there are four horns that try to stop us. Four horns that want to stop us. Number one, it's the horn of lack. The horn of lack. In, in the scripture, if you read Zechariah, he promised to his people that he would advance them, watch this, through a spirit of prosperity. He says, I'm going to prosper you, and I'm going to advance you, and I'm going to enlarge you. Many of you know the promise God gave us. He says, I will increase you greatly, and you will be stronger than your enemy. So understand that whenever God desires to advance us to a new dimension, he blesses us first. Mm. How many have been experiencing the blessings of God? And he blesses us first so that we might be able to advance. God told them, he says, I'm going to advance you through the spirit of prosperity. And we all know this, that God has called us to prosper. He has called us to excellence. We know that we have to work and give to be rewarded in the kingdom. We know that. We've been learning that in the house of God, that if we want to be blessed, come on, we've got to work. Amen. How many thank God for their work? Amen. How many know the work is the ministry? The ministry is the work. And how many know when you work and God blesses you and you give, God begins to prosper you? Come on and thank him if he's prospered you. 
See, he begins to prosper us. We know that we have to work and give to be blessed. But the horn of lack is a spirit that wants us to back down. It's a spirit that wants us to back down from blessing, to back down from prosperity, from back down. See, what the spirit of lack says to a believer is that this is the level you will operate in the rest of your life. See, some of us have come this far by faith. We've come this far by working hard. We've come this far by giving. But the spirit of lack comes in and says, this is the level you will operate in the rest of your life. And it attacks you. Watch this. It attacks you the minute you declare to yourself that this is the time. Now is the time for me to go to another level. I'm preaching better than you're saying amen. It attacks at the time where you declare in your spirit. The minute we said this is the year to build is the minute you stepped up and said, I'm going to build God's kingdom. I'm going to build my life. I'm going to build my family. I'm going to build my resources. And the minute you declare in your spirit that you're going to step up, that's when the horn of lack begins to blow. It wants you to back down. Tell your neighbor, don't back down. The spirit of lack says, you're going to hang out at this level the rest of your life. This is going to be your financial situation the rest of your life. This is going to be the car you drive the rest of your life. This is going to be the house you live in the rest of your life. This is going to be the ministry size you have the rest of your life. This is all God's going to do for you. But I came to tell you, God has given us the power to overcome lack within our life. I've seen how God has given me everything I need from the moment I came to this city. I've witnessed even this weekend and the doors that God has been opening for me and for this church. I've seen it from the very first day I came to this city, how God has always been a provider. I remember when I first got here, my oldest daughter was very young. She was only about six or seven years old. And when I first got here, you know, Georgina always wanted the kids to be involved in sports or different activities. You know, they've they been involved in everything, dancing, cheerleading, God. Anyways, and I remember we put her in Little League. She was actually in Little League, not softball, but baseball, Little T-ball, right there in Chula Vista. And I remember when she first started, yeah, I'd go to her games. And I don't know, you know what she was, she might have been, I don't know what she was, you know, everybody was busy. The church was small. I remember one day just being there, watching her game on a Saturday, all by myself. All by myself, I was there, and I'm watching her out there hit that tee. And, you know, all the other kids have family, and seven people there, eight people there. And I'm just there by myself. And I remember having this moment, sitting there in the bleachers, watching her, thinking, I don't have anybody. I don't have anybody that I know. I'm like a stranger in a foreign land. And I felt like that spirit of lack. Come on, somebody. And I said, man, I don't have my family. I, I, I don't, you know, at that time, the team that was here, you know, I don't think they liked me very much. I don't think the people liked me very much. It didn't matter. I was just, you know, I've been through that before, but I'm sitting there. I have no family, no support. And I'm thinking to myself, how am I going to reach this city by myself? How am I going to make an impact all by myself? And the horns of lack began to blow. The horns of lack began to blow. And, 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 and even those horns started to tell me, you made a mistake. You should have never went to San Diego. You should have stood in L.A. You should have stood at that training center. You should have stood back over there because, you know, that's where you were winning. Come on, somebody. But how many know God is always faithful? How many know God is always faithful? How many know God always gives you what you need? How many know God always sends the people? How many know God always sends the resources? Don't give up. Stay in the fight. Keep built. Oh, man, I'm preaching good this morning. So the first horn is the horn of lack. The second horn is the horn of limitation. Now, the spirit of limitation is different than the spirit of lack. Tell your neighbor, it's different. Because someone... With the spirit of limitation says this, watch. 
I know that the blessing of God's are, blessings of God are real. I know that salvation for the family is real. I know that healing is possible. I know that prosperity is within reach. I know that the Holy Spirit can move. I know the calling of God is real. But the spirit of limitation says, none of that is for me. None of that is for me. Or, or, or some of that is for me. But I can't have everything God has called me to have. See, it's the spirit of limitation that puts a ceiling over you. That some of us here right now is that every time you declare it, the spirit of limitation comes in and puts a ceiling over your head. The spirit of limitation puts a barrier in front of you. The spirit of limitation tries to block you from going into the next level of faith, into the next level of blessing, into the next level of ministry, into the, oh, you're not saying nothing today. It's the spirit of limitation that stops people. It, it's a spirit that says you can succeed, but only to a certain degree. You can have blessing, but only to a certain degree. You see God blessing this one on the right, this one on the left, this one behind you, this one in front of you. And you say, that's nice, but it's never going to happen for me. But I came to break a spirit of limitation in your life. I really believe this word is from the Lord. I came to break a spirit of limitation in your life. I came to remove that ceiling. I came to remove that barrier. I came to tell you, listen, don't let the enemy, don't let the horns of limitation blow. Tell your neighbor, silence those horns. You can succeed. You can be blessed. You know what the spirit of limitation says? You peak. You can't go no higher. I was watching uh, this thing the other day with a horse, and they had this little chair, this little flimsy plastic chair with a rope. And they took that rope, and they tied the horse with the rope to the chair. And some of you might have seen that. And... This person came up to them and said, listen, how in the world can this powerful horse with all its muscles and all of its strength be tied with a rope to this chair and not move and stay in its place and stay right where it's at? And the trainer said to the person, the reason this rope holds his horse is because when this horse was just a little pony, I trained him with this rope. And this rope restricted him at when he was small. This rope kept him in his place when he was small. This rope, mm, this is already preaching. This rope kept him in his place and said, you can only go this far when he was small. And as he grew, watch this, as he grew, he got used to the rope. And when I talk to people every week in this church or wherever I go, I see people that are letting ropes hold them. Because when you were small, they said you can never win. When you were small, you, they said you will never do anything great. When you were small, they said your marriage is never going to make it. When you were small, they said you can never be blessed financially. When you were small, they said you're always going to stay in the hood. You're always going to stay in the ghetto. But I came to cut the rope today. I came to take off the spirit of limitation. I came to tell you greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I came to tell you you're the head and not the tail. You're a bump. third horn who's getting something the horn of hindrance see these horns want to blow the people of Israel were scattered because the horns are blowing and the horns want to blow the horn of hindrance this is the big one here because this is the one we all face this is the one that we don't face once we don't face twice we face three times we we face four times a, I want to tell you, for every level, you're going to face the horn of hindrance. Hear me now. You might be able to silence the horn of limitation. You might be able to silence the horn of lack. But the horn of hindrance, you face it at every level. No matter what level you go to, the horn of hindrance is going to be there. This is a big one. We all face it. Paul, he called out the horn of hindrance. He called it out in the scripture when he wrote in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 18. Watch what he says. He says, we wanted to come to you, but Satan hindered us. Oh, this is powerful. We wanted to come to the church, but Satan stood in our way. Satan hindered us from coming. And Paul's life shows you and I something powerful. 
He shows that he may have been hindered, but he was never defeated. He may have been hindered, but he was never defeated. He may have had the enemy come against him. He might have been whipped. He might have been stoned. He might have been shipwrecked. He might have been mocked. He might have been spit on. He might have been ridiculed. He might have been plotted against. He had a snake bite his hand and he shook it off. And he might have been hindered. But in the end, Paul got to his mission. Come on, somebody. And I came to tell you, even though hindrance rises up, and even though the enemy rises up against you, he is giving you the power to overcome the enemy. Touch your neighbor, tell him you're going to make it. The spirit of hindrance comes to poke you. The spirit of hindrance comes to be a thorn in your side, to poke you, to mock you, to stand in front of you, to stop you, and to knock you down. Am I in, a, in an honest church this morning? I'm going to ask again, am I in an honest church this morning? Am I, am I in a church that wants to keep it real this morning? Is there anyone here you've ever been poked? You've ever been knocked down? You've ever fallen? You've ever made a mistake? But I came to tell you, Paul may have fallen down, but he never stood down. He got back up on his feet, and that's what some of you are about to do this morning. No matter what the enemy has thrown against you, God has given you the power to stand up this morning and to move towards your mission. I'm encouraging myself. <laughs> I'm encouraging myself. You said, Pastor, have you ever been knocked down? Yes. Pastor, have you ever tripped up? Yes. Pastor, have you ever made a mistake? Yes. But I came to tell you, my mistakes don't define me. The things that have tried to hinder me don't define me. Sickness doesn't define me. Problems don't define me. Family issues don't define me. I don't even talk about them even though they're there. Because the Lord has given me a mission. And I said, I'm not going to stop until my foot touches the promised land. And when I get to the promised land, I'm going to rejoice. I'm going to give God glory. I'm going to give him praise. Give him praise right now like you're going into the promised land. Give him praise right now like you're not going to stay down. why some of you aren't clapping because you're saying I'm doing good right now but I, how many feel like you need this word for the right season you may be doing good right now but there's going to come a day where you got to come out of that fire you got to come out of that storm I'm doing good right now pastor That's why I know I know you're doing good but your season's coming You're going to take that giant down. Yeah. Tell your neighbor, we're going to take that giant down. Yeah. Give God one more praise. Amen. I'm almost done. Yeah. I got to move quick. The fourth horn. The vision of the four horns. Lastly is the horn of intimidation. The prophet said, I had a vision of four horns and it cost for all the people to be scattered. It caused for all the people to be scattered. And that fourth horn is the horn of intimidation. Watch this. The, the horn of lack, the horn of limits stands above you. The horn of, of uh, hindrance stands in front of you. But the horn of intimidation stands behind you. And as you're moving forward, it whispers in your ear. <laughs> it lies to you. Can we talk about it? Can we, can we expose the devil this morning? You're moving forward and that spirit of intimidation walks behind you. And it whispers in your ear and it mocks you. It says... Oh, if they only knew the real you. That's why husbands, wives, you got to learn how to talk to each other. Because that's the horn of intimidation. Well, if they really knew who you were in the church. See, <laughs> so I silenced the horn of intimidation. 
<laughs> See how quiet it is right now. <laughs> or the kids, you know. If they really knew the kind of father and mother you were. That, that, that spirit walks behind you. And if you talk like that, the devil's using you. That's a fact. The devil is using you as the horn. Blowing through you. You got to tame that tongue. You got to tame that mouth. You got to get that mouth under control. You got to be like a horse and put a bit in your mouth. And ride on into the old country road, like he said. But that spirit walks behind you. Tell your neighbor, it walks behind you. You know what it says to you? It says you, you don't have what it takes. Some of you right now, it says you'll never preach like Pastor Al. You'll never minister, preach like Sister Georgina. You'll never preach as good as Anthony. Look how God, you, 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 that's not for you. you. You're weak. You can't do it. You're a second-class citizen. You're not connected. You don't have the connections. You don't have what it takes. You don't, you, 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 your, your past is too messed up. God can't use you. Am I talking real? You got a jacket. They talk about you. They gossip about you. That's the spirit of intimidation. You know what that spirit tries to do? It comes so it could take the joy from the victory God's currently giving you. It comes to take the joy from the moment you're having now. Some of you have had the breakthrough. You're getting blessed. Ooh, man, this is good. You, God is opening doors. You're, you're stepping into great things right now. Someone say now. now. And then the spirit of intimidation comes and tells you, it won't last. Oh, God's setting you up for a big trial. Ooh, get ready. Here it comes. Oh, you, and then you're like, oh, I want to rejoice with the pastor. I want to rejoice with the church. But I can't rejoice because I'm scared. But how many know God always brings the hope? He told Zechariah this as I get ready to bring it in. He said, when the horns blew, I sent the carpenters. I couldn't understand it. I go, what in the world? What in the world does that mean? And then I realized Jesus was a carpenter. When the horn of lack and the horn of intimidation and the horn of fear and the horn of lies begin to blow against God's people, what does he do? He said, I sent the carpenter of all carpenters. I sent Jesus to die on the cross of Calvary. Oh, come on, somebody. Oh, this is good right now. The good news is that you got a carpenter. You got an advocate. You got a warrior on your side. That's why Zechariah said, not by might nor by power. You're not going to fight him with your human strategies. You're not going to fight him with brute force. What are you going to fight him with? You're going to fight him in the spirit realm. The Lord said, I sent the carpenter. Someone say, the carpenter. And what did the carpenter say about himself? Watch. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he has anointed me. And he said, the same spirit that is on me is the same spirit I've given you in the upper room. This is your moment to walk in the spirit, to walk in the anointing, to walk in the power of God. Praise him in this place, everybody. Praise him if you're ready to go to another level. neighbor he has anointed me stand with me as I give you this last thing let me receive this let me receive this this is a good message come on clap if you receive this message those, sil those horns are being silenced in somebody's life for the first time they're realizing I don't gotta stay stuck right here the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach to advance the kingdom of God see we can't stay limited touch two people tell them we, we can't stay limited 
Tell them we're a big church. Tell them we're a big church. You say, I don't feel big. I didn't feel big either when I was watching Avery play t-ball and I had nobody with me. But when I represented San Diego PD yesterday, you better believe I felt big. Oh God, I feel big today. When I was up at that prayer mountain with all the elders, you better believe I felt big with our founders and part. I felt big. Listen, how many of God can take you from glory? But you, you got to take the limits off. You got to get up. You got to overcome the hindrance. You say, but I don't, I don't feel big. I don't feel big. Well, God works in a way where he puts big anointing on something small. He said, I will use the what? Foolish. Are there any fools for Christ in here? Come on, you're just a fool for a carpenter. Come on, you're a fool for a carpenter. And he says, I will put my anointing my big anointing on something small. Someone say something small. You know, to build a ministry, it's not built on just the gifts of a few, but it's on the small sacrifices of many. It's the small sacrifices of many that builds great things for God. And the Lord, when he wanted to feed 5,000, he didn't need the in and out truck. He just needed two loaves and five fish from a little kid that was willing to give up his lunch. And he took that small meal and he anointed it. And it met a lot of needs. You might be here, you don't feel like much, but I came to tell you that God puts a strong anointing on small things. Small things. You know, a small prayer makes a big difference. A small prayer makes a big difference. Yesterday, we were at the park, and we saw that a small person makes a big difference. Those kids. How many are proud of your kids? We hold back because we say, I don't have anything big to give. God doesn't need something big. He just needs something small. A small sermon makes a big difference. A small Bible study makes a di big difference. Sometimes it's not the big, big flashy songs. Sometimes it's just a small a cappella song that invites the power of the Holy Ghost. I'm preaching good. Come on, help me. I'm preaching real good right now. We want to be so big, but God says I'm looking to anoint something small. Small prayer, small sermon, small song, small person, small cup of coffee with somebody in the right timing. Just not the venti, the tall. Just a little cup of coffee. The other day I had it. one thing my pastor taught me. If you're watching, this is so valuable. He said, Al, he told me this many years ago in this church, he goes, Al, it doesn't take much. Just a little time. Just a little phone call. Just a little cup of coffee. Just a little meal. Just a little piece of pizza with somebody. Come on, how many know that makes a power? God anoints. Come on, who's catching it? God anoints small things. because we don't have anything big and God says listen if you got something big and you're not giving it give it but he's also saying if you have something small and you're holding back because you feel it's not big enough God says I'm able to put my anointing on that small thing you have and how are you gonna silence those horns to start asking God to anoint what's small in your life 
Just take what little you have and put it in the master's hands and say, I shall not be limited any longer. I shall not be hindered any longer. I shall not be stopped any longer. If that's you, I want you to come to this altar right now. If you have something to leave at this altar, I want you to come on up here right now. Say, hey, I don't, I don't have anything real big, but I got something small that God can anoint. I'm going to take off those limits take off those things that are trying to stop me. And I'm going to remove that ceiling and remove those barriers. And if you've been knocked down, you're going to get back up again. Come on, all over this place. This is a, this is a motivational sermon. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. If we can take one step towards the altar, everybody. One step towards the altar.